are we facing the end? I get this question sometimes. People ask me. Well, when we look at uh, what's happening with some of the movies that we often see, you know, like uh, Heaven and Earth is about to collide. Remember Deep Impact? How many of you have seen the movie Deep Impact? No. Or uh, Armageddon, Bruce Willis? No, nobody saw those movies. Okay, they always doomsday about the end of the world coming to an end. And then remember the sum of all fears? That movie is one of my best because it is so plausible of terrorists getting the atomic bomb. That is so plausible. For me, that's the most, most realistic of all the movies. And then, uh, of course, we've seen uh, the, uh, the day after tomorrow about uh, climate change and, and the world being flooded and frozen. And then, remember to 2012, the Mayan calendar that they've said that uh, the world would end in 2012? Well, here we are. Nothing has happened. <laughs> so it's all these doomsday movies and always predicting the end times, right? But it's interesting, Stephen Hawking, before he passed away, he gave seven scenarios of how the earth could end. And one of them was climate change, plagues, which we've had uh, COVID-19, and now uh, monkeypox. Uh, and whatever, I mean, uh, there's more to come. We don't know who, who's uh, uh, doing gain of function with these laboratories, right? And then, of course, uh, nuclear war. Let me tell you right now, we are, I just looked at the clock, we are n uh, nine seconds away from a nuclear war, according to the atomic clock because Iran is a huge threat. Russia has been supplying Iran with uranium, enriched uranium, and they have already developed uh, nuclear power stations. And we're not sure how Israel is going to retaliate to knock out those power stations or just their, uh, uh, their docks and ports where they have oil. And so we are living in precarious times. A nuclear war could, if something happens, and then you got Putin, who can, who's a little bit trigger happy, what could happen? You see, this is a scenario that could happen, but you know what? Not according to scripture. And then the other scenarios, the fourth is a big asteroid will come and destroy the earth just like it did the dinosaurs back centuries, or a super volcano, volcano, chalupa, I'm almost Speaking in Portuguese now. Okay, not tongues. <laughs> okay. And then intelligent uh, machines, which we have uh, right now AI, artificial intelligence. And uh, there's a, a new threat right now. Rather than just computers, there's, it's called quantum computing. How many have heard of quantum computing? Whoa. It is run on atomic energy, and it can, it's about thousands of times faster than the ordinary computers. And they have to keep the computer at uh, perfect zero. I've been reading up on it. It's scary stuff. Intelligent machines, and of course, uh, androids and all that. And the seventh scenario, they say, is a death of a star, which would cause a black hole, which would suck everything in. That really sucks. <laughs> and gamma ray burst could uh, wipe out everything. So that's what some scientists feel that could happen, the threat. <clears throat> but that's not what the Bible says. <clears throat> and we're going to be looking at how things pan out in the end. But are we facing the end? Well, we are in the end of the end times. Can I tell you that? We are in the end of the end times. And Jesus said it's the beginning of labor pains. Ladies, you know, when you gave birth, you know very well what it's like. And labor pains can be an hour apart, half an hour, 15 minutes, and you know, oh, it's coming. And that's what we're seeing right now with uh, 
It's happening fast and with intensity, the events that are happening right now, especially with Israel and the countries coming against Israel. That's predicted in Ezekiel 37 and uh, 38 and 39, sorry, 38, 39. We'll get into Ezekiel next time we meet. And just to show you what's happening. Anyway, the signs are, are happening fast, and we would be wise to pay attention to the signs. That's what Jesus said. He said that we need to pay attention to the signs and be ready. Everything we're going to learn about this theme is to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Not to be scared and be fearful. No, to be ready. And Jesus said we should look at the signs and know the signs. Did you know that? And so... Signs are not to scare us, but to prepare us to be alert and ready for Christ's coming. So let's look at uh, the importance of biblical prophecy. And and I wrote uh, about this at the beginning of uh, the introduction. And and what I said is this. Uh, I, I said that the, today the church has become preoccupied with the issues facing the world and has allowed itself to be sucked into a whirlpool of world problems and is making an effort to be a friend of the world. That's the church today. I'm seeing this. One of the basic reasons for the church being too preoccupied with the world is that it lacks, it lacks a vibrant expectation for the return of Jesus. There are many churches that are not preaching this. They're not talking about this. and They're not teaching about a great expectation for the coming of Jesus we need to hear this. We hear so much bad news and negative news and wars and terrorists. People are living in despair and hopelessness. There's no hope. Our hope is Jesus' return. And we need to focus on that. And that's, that's where my passion is, by the way. So when the church loses sight that this is a fallen world, deep in sin and evil, and when the church thinks that its primary role is to stop the evil, it is living with an impossible task. We can't stop this evil. We can you know, preach the gospel and pray and try to thwart it a bit, but we can't. It's, it's going to culminate at the end. But the hope is in the return of Christ. So we need to evangelize. We need to evangelize and get people ready for eternity. This world and its issues and problems are passing away. Eternity is the ultimate reality that will remain forever. And that's what we need to be doing, preparing people for eternity. Not to live the rest of their lives here on earth. We are sojourners. We're passing through. This is not our home. And uh, also, too, uh, Job said, I came in naked and I'll, I'm going to leave naked. You can't take anything with you. One third of the Bible is devoted to prophecy. One third. And the, the word we use to, in, in theology is called eschatology. Eschatos is Greek for the last things. Ology is the study. So the study of the last things. So it's the study of the end times. It deals with the future, the final destiny of humanity, the return of Christ to the new heaven and the new earth. So that's what eschatology is. And I've said this, 75% has been fulfilled, another 25% yet to be fulfilled. So you cannot study the scriptures without studying prophecy because it's one third of the Bible. So the return of the Lord is mentioned 318 times in 260 chapters of the New Testament. Now, that's important, isn't it? But why aren't people really talking about that if that is a major theme? Do you see what I'm saying? And the only subject mentioned more frequently than the second coming is the subject of salvation. How we come to, to be saved. So where's, where's the origin of prophecy? Okay, it doesn't come from humans. Here's the origin of prophecy. And Peter writes this, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. So it was not willed by humans. Or they created and they thought it up. No. But prophets, though human, how? They spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit inspired and carried them along. That means God revealed it through his Spirit to the prophets. So the origin of prophecy. There are tw to over 2,000 
phrases and clauses in the scriptures that say God spoke, the word of God came, or God or the Lord said. So the prophets, that's what they wrote. So the prophet spoke, and I like what Jeremiah said. It's, uh, he said, but if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then his word is in my heart like a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. So Jeremiah was saying, listen, God has revealed himself, and he's given me these, these prophecies. I can't hold it in. i got to speak the truth. And so he was burdened with that. And, and he felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the Spirit working that he had to speak and prophesy it. And so that's what happened in, in, with the prophets. And so God is the author of Scripture, not humans. The Bible is, a, is the authorship is God, which he used a human instrumentality to write. He spoke to them. And the Bible is written over 1,400 years. And there is how many books? How many remember their Sunday school lesson? 66 books. And over 1,400 years by uh, different writers. And the message, you can connect everything. You know that the Bible has the most cross-references than any other book in, in human history. You can find it, it just amazing how 1400 years generations 66 books and they're all in unity dealing with the same message who's the message jesus amazing could that be invented by humans no that's another argument for the authenticity of scripture anyway so here's the five reasons why prophecy is important are you ready Number one, prophecy validates the Bible. It shows that the Bible is reliable and authentic because there are prophecies that have been fulfilled. If 75% of the prophecies have been fulfilled accurately, whoa, who can? Who can predict the future and, and, and predict these events thousands of years before they happen and then they happen? Amazing. Isaiah prophesied about Cyrus 200 years before he lived. In Isaiah 44 and 45, Isaiah actually says his name before he even existed, that he would be instrumental in allowing the, the Israelites to leave Babylon and return to their land. He was actually from Persia, present-day Iran. Do you know that the Iranians are not the regime that's in control of Iran, but 90% of the Iranians are supportive of Israel. I know that for a fact. Because I have quite a few Iranian friends and they've told me. 90% of the country wants nothing to do with Islam. Out of the 80,000 mosques in Iran, 50,000 have closed down. Nobody's attending. You know what backfired? 9-11. When the Muslim world saw, is this what our religion teaches? Now, those that were the radicalized ones are the Shia, the Shiites. The Sunnis are not. Anyway, many of them started to seek who's the real God. And many of them were praying, God, who is the real God? Because this, this Allah, he's vengeful. He's a, he really wants us to kill. I, that's not right. Because in Islam, Allah is not a God of love nor a God of grace. He's demanding. And if you don't comply with that, you're not going to get the 72 virgins in heaven. So he prophesied, and then Daniel prophesied too of four world powers. Of course, he was in the Babylonian captivity, but he, he prophesied the Medo Persians would come before they came. Then he prophesied the, the Greek Empire, which was uh, uh, Alexander the Great. As a matter of fact, when we went to Caesarea Philippi, Benias, remember the source of the River Jordan? We saw uh, the pan god that uh, Alexander built just, just before Christ's time. 
and then the Roman Empire coming in exactly the way that Daniel prophesied in the order. Amazing stuff. Prophetically. So here we have, from uh, Barton's uh, encyclopedia, he says there are 12... 139 prophecies in the Old Testament and 578 prophecies in the New Testament for a total of 1,817 prophecies total in the Bible. Okay. Now, about 300 of those prophecies were fulfilled by Christ's first coming. Christ made it very clear that the Old Testament spoke of him. This is what he said. He said to his people, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. So all of scripture, those 66 books written over a period of 1,400 years, are testifying of who? Jesus. The promised seed. That he would crush the serpent's head. That's prophetic too. So we have over th- about 300 prophecies concerning Jesus, and he fulfilled them accurately. His birth predicted, the place of his birth, born of a virgin, he would be called Emmanuel, God with us. He would be uh, preceded by John, his triumphal entry on a colt, and then betrayed by a friend, Judas, and crucified with sinners. Wow. Hands and feet pierced, his resurrection, his ascension, those are just a few. And he fulfilled them perfectly. So if Jesus fulfilled 300 prophecies perfectly, and the other 25% that's still yet to be fulfilled, you can count on God, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. This actually substantiates the authenticity, validity of the scriptures. It's a powerful, powerful uh, argument. I've had atheists and agnostics, and I said, did you know that uh, Christ uh, fulfilled 300 prophecies perfectly and all this? And they said, no. But uh, many atheists, when I challenge them sometimes, I don't just challenge them like that, but I ask them, you know, uh, so there's no God. How do you know? Have you read about it? Have you done any research or anything? Mm, No. But but I hear, I hear. Oh, you, you be, you're believing on hearsay? And I tell them, listen, I've been studying the Bible and the propheticness of the Bible is amazing. Also, I've gone to Israel and I've seen with my eyes the archaeological digs that prove, without refuting the Bible, prove 100% the reliability of the Bible through our archaeology. And they say, where are you getting that? Well, I, I go to Israel. I see it. I study. I'm reading and then they would get perplexed. But I've had a few come to Christ. <laughs> Got to challenge them in their presuppositions. Because they don't know these facts. They're, you know, people, I hate to say this, they're ignorant. They go by hearsay or a slogan. God doesn't exist. Yeah, God doesn't exist. Wait a minute, how do you know? Have you studied it? No. Oh, so it's hearsay. Dr. Charles Raleigh, I like what he said. According to the laws of chance... This is about Jesus fulfilling the 300 prophecies. According to the laws of chance, it would require 200 billion earths populated with 4 billion people each to come up with one person whose life could fulfill 100, only 100, not three, only 100 accurate prophecies without any errors in sequence. Yet the scriptures record not only 100, but over 300 prophecies that were fulfilled by Christ's first coming. So what are the chances? He's saying what? Require 200 billion earths. What? And would require what? Four billion on each planet for one person to fulfill only one of those hundred prophecies. What are the chances of that? And then Dr. Hugh Ross, who's an astrophysicist, this is what he said. He's a Christian, by the way. He's one of the top scientists, Canadian-born, lives in California, and he's an apologist. He defends the faith uh, uh, with uh, atheists and agnostics. He's, he's super, super intelligent. 
He's an astrophysicist. It's amazing. Anyway, he said this, since the, poss the probability for one of those prophecies having been fulfilled by chance averages less than 1 in 10. That's a conservative figure. And since the prophecies are for the most part independent of each uh, one another, the odds for these prophecies having been fulfilled by chance without any error is less than 1, that's 10 to the power of 2,000. That is one with 2,000 zeros written after it. That's not a million, it's not a billion, it's not a zillion, it's not a, a trillion, it's not a zillion, it's a zillion, 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 zillion. Do you get it? That is phenomenal. Of Jesus fulfilling 300 of them perfectly. I hope you get uh, more appreciative of the scriptures after today. Because <laughs> it's an amazing book. Amazing. No other book in the world like the scriptures. No other book. And then the third, I got, okay, let's get, continue on. Prophecy offers hope in an age of hopelessness. We're getting a lot of bad news. Suicide rates are up. Kids are on hard drugs and fentanyl. Many are, are dying by the hundreds almost on a weekly basis in Canada. Why? Because people have no hope. Hopelessness everywhere. And we see the economy and politics, the threat of a nuclear war, climate change, crime is increasing by leaps and bounds, terrorism and all that. So I came across this just uh, uh, last last week. Actually, was it Friday, or was it Sunday? Sunday, the sixth, uh, October the sixth. I came across the Barna Research Center, and Barna found that fifty six percent of Generation Z, those that, that's the generation born between nineteen ninety seven and two thousand thirteen, that's the generation right now. Okay and reported experiencing regular battles with anxiety, fear, and depression in the past year. The millennials, born between 1981 and 1996, are 49% are suffering of the same thing. So the younger generation, Generation Z and the millennials, they're suffering from depression, fear, and anxiety. And the research raises some important issues about how one's worldview can impact humans. So what is their worldview? What is the worldview of these young people today? They're messed up. You know, uh, some of them are even, you know, transitioning and not knowing. Uh, let me talk about that just a little bit. When I studied psychology, Dr. Eric Erickson He's uh, back in, in, in the late 60s, he came up with this phrase, uh, identity crises. He said many adolescents between uh, the ages of 9 to about 13, 12, they go through an identity crisis. They're trying to find themselves. They don't know. So if these kids want to transition to another sex. Wait a minute. There are those that have done, and now they're 18 and 20, and many regret what they did because they have not, they can't make uh, good rational decisions until you get the age of accountability, which is 18. Why do we don't allow kids to drink and get a license? Then we can allow them to make this life-changing decision on their own? Whoa. And so kids are messed up. They're lost. This, these two generations, Generation Z and the millennials, they're lost. And, and these issues like rejection or apathy toward God, feeling no purpose in life and the rejection of absolute morality and truth, that's what they're lacking. It, it's a postmodern world. Postmodern means that everything is relative to my experience. I'm God. I decide what is right and wrong. I decide, well, you're putting a lot of pressure on you and you can't handle it. And so it's the worldview. And because they don't, they see the world and what's happening in the world. They have no hope. But that's why we need to talk about the second coming of Jesus, because that's the hope. Knowing there's a future. 
brighter future. They don't know there's a brighter future. So people are lost and see no hope. And that's one of the reasons why prophecy is important. And God is in control. This is what God said to Isaiah. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So God's in control. He's made known to us what? The end from the beginning and ancient times, what is still to come. Aren't you glad he did? He's revealed it through the scripture to us. So we're not, you know, blind regarding his purpose. So don't be afraid or fearful. God's in control. He's going to bring it to a happy ending for those who trust in him. So prophecy reveals the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That's another reason. So we've talked about the 300 specific prophecies concerning Jesus. And of course, Revelation 1.1 starts with this. The revelation from Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Jesus revealed that revelation to John on the island of Patmos to show him what's going to be unfolding in the future. So prophecies concerning Christ. Christ would be descendant of Abraham, but that he would be from the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49.10, and from the house of David, and so goes on and on. Okay, let's continue on. The next one is the study of, of prophecy promotes evangelism. It does. I've had people come to Jesus Christ in these seminars. Remember in Tilsonburg, I did the end times one time. We had about 120 people out. These, these ladies can vouch for that. And we had uh, uh, a number of families come to Jesus Christ, even their teenage kids came to Christ at the end because they said wow I want to be in on this I don't want to be left behind (laughs) anyway so how do we have some examples in the Bible yeah Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch remember he was reading a script uh, a scripture from um, Isaiah 53 and the eunuch didn't know he was the treasurer of Candace and uh, Philip said, do you understand? No, no, come. And he went into the chair and he explained the prophecy. Isaiah 53 is talking about the suffering lamb, the suffering servant. And he came to faith, the eunuch. He got saved. And then he said, there's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? <laughs> wow. Sometimes we as Baptists, we wait until, you know, oh, got to wait a few weeks before we baptize you, you know. Uh, anyway, spontaneous baptism they practice in the Bible. And also my personal experience in teaching prophecy and eschatology, I've seen that happen. In, in Toronto, when I taught, uh, I, I taught about the end times. So, so the stuff I'm dealing with to, through this series is uh, very much updated. And um, But back then, it was 9 11. Because I was in 2001, I was at uh, Kipling Avenue Baptist Church in Toronto. But anyway, people were very interested in the mysteries, and I had so many come out. We had this huge uh, uh, Italian community come out from Vaughan. <laughs> and it was through one lady. Her name was Maria, and she was from Iraq. She was an Assyrian Christian. She came out, and she said, oh, I got to invite my friends she invited an italian family and that italian family boom 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 boom. and i had so many come to faith in jesus christ because they saw that prophecy validates the authenticity of scripture this is not a book of fiction this is real stuff and they felt the, the holy spirit convict them i've never converted anyone in my life by the way it's the holy spirit He's the one that convicts the person of their need of Jesus, not me. But I'm just the beggar who's found the living bread. And I showed the other beggars where they can get the living bread. <laughs> okay. Anyway, also my my brother-in-law, um, Chris, Rosalind's brother, came to faith uh, through through prof- uh, studying prophecy. And uh, he, of course, was raised in the Christian home. But, you know, he started being like the prodigal. And then, but he came back. And he started a Bible study group uh, on prophecy, and they were studying and praying, and and a number of young people came to Christ in that Bible study. Amazing stuff. So the last reason, the study of prophecy impacts lives. It does it. It really impacts your life. And this is, is one of the scriptures that really affected me profoundly when I was studying it. 
and it was uh, about the judgment seat of Christ. Now, let me explain this. I'm going to read this passage first of all. In 2 Corinthians, it says, So we make it our goal to please him, that's Jesus, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we, this is important, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Okay, what is this? This is not a judgment whether you're going to go into heaven or not. No, you're in heaven already. It's rewards. What have you done for Jesus? Okay, and the Bible says that some will suffer loss. That means they won't get a reward. The Bible talks about five crowns. I'm going to be talking about this in our series. I'm going to be talking about the judgment seat of Christ and what it means. So this really impacted my life. I said, whoa, there's accountability here. It's just, you know. I'm not just saved by the skin of my teeth and going to heaven, but there's something else I need to be doing, working for the Lord and honoring him and serving him, because in the end, we're going to receive a crown from him. And I don't want to go into heaven with empty hands. It's like going to a birthday party, you're invited, and you didn't bring a gift. Has it ever happened to you? You feel kind of mm, awkward. Oh, I don't have a gift. At least I want to win one crown because I want to place it at Jesus' feet because he's the one that made it possible. And that's what the elders are doing. Remember the 24 elders in heaven? What are they doing? They're laying their crowns before the throne of God. So that's the, the judgment seat. We'll be looking at that a little later. So prophecy will always motivate us to live lives consecrated and dedicated to the Lord. So there we are, the five reasons, okay, that prophecy is important. Now you understand that how important it is. We need to know this. And then, but a word of caution. Some have gone off on a tangent by always seeking some new sensational truth. Others have become proud or ex exploitative with their newfound knowledge of prophecy. I've seen that happen. Others in their interpretation of prophecy have a tendency to speak on areas where the Bible is silent. There are those who make the mistake of fixing dates, which have been proven to be wrong. No one knows the day or the hour that Jesus is coming. But Jesus said, look for the signs because it will be an indication that the time is coming. But we don't know the day or the hour. We may know the season but not the day or the hour. So the word of caution is this. Sometimes minor differences of opinion and eschatology have become a source of irritation, leading to quarrels, debates, and it breaks Christian fellowship. That's wrong. And I know people, you know, well, I'm a Calvinist. No, I'm a Mar Arminianist. I hate to say this, hogwash. Okay, I'm looking at Jerry. Jerry? Here's my peripheral vision. Here's Calvinism, Arminianism. But I'm focusing my gaze and fixing my eyes on Jesus. I'm not going to interpret the scripture through Calvin. I'm not going to interpret the scripture through Arminius. I'm going to do my hermeneutics. And the hermeneutics is this. It's the science of interpretation. Study the scriptures and say what it says rather than interpreting through the glasses of Calvin or Arminius. Do you see what I'm saying? My focus is Jesus. The scripture, what he teaches. These are issues that divide us. And I've seen this divide churches. For me, that's the enemy coming in, filling people with pride that they know more than anybody else. For me, that's Sorry. And we need to know this. Paul said this. He says, for we know in part. Do we know in full? We know in part and we prophesy in part. So we need to be careful. Right? So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. 
And that's what Peter is saying. We need to. What's the, what's the, uh, the purpose of uh, prophecy is to be prepared and ready for Jesus' coming. And therefore we say Maranatha, which in the Greek means come, Lord. Come, Lord. Jesus. Maranatha. Okay, and here's a chart that I'm going to print out for each one of you to, to take next week. Well, not next week, next time we meet. And here's a chart that talks about, uh, it's a timeline where the arrow goes, uh, ends with the new heaven and new earth, and it starts from the past. The cross symbolizes Jesus. And between Jesus and, and the tribulation period, there's the church age, that's where we're living in right now. And we're so close right now. And now uh, there's three arrows during the tribulation for the rapture because there's the pre-trib rapturist, the mid-trib rapturist, and the post-trib rapturists. There's positions, but we only see in part. Okay, so I'll be dealing with that, the being taken away suddenly to the Father's house. And then the coming of Jesus. Now, the Great Tribulation period deals with uh, uh, Revelation chapter 5 to chapter 19. All those chapters, chapter 5 to 19, deals with the Great Tribulation period. With the... Uh, uh, the scrolled judgments, the seal judgments, I should say, that are broken, the seven seals, then the seven trumpet judgments, and then the seven bowl judgments. All those judgments is God is going to pour out his wrath on the wickedness of the earth. It all happens during the great tribulation period, okay, which is a seven-year period because Daniel says, Daniel is the key to all prophecy. And then at the end, Jesus comes he comes to end the battle of Armageddon. Armageddon is going to occur at the very end of the tribulation period. And then Jesus comes to set up his millennial kingdom, okay? Thousand-year reign. Now, how do we know it's a thousand years? Because uh, Revelation chapter 1920, they talk about a thousand-year reign, that Jesus is going to come. Okay, so I'm a pre-mill. This is a, called premillennial view. I'm premillennial. You know why? Because I've looked at the other positions. I've looked at post-millennial and amillennial. The amill, they say, well, we're living right now in the age of the kingdom because Jesus is ruling on earth through his church. But wait a minute, Satan's not bound. He's tempting the nations. How can you say? Because in the millennial, he's going to be bound. He won't be able to tempt the nations. And we're not seeing the lion and the lamb sleeping together like Isaiah chapter 11 talks about the millennial kingdom and what's going to happen. We haven't seen that. How can you say we are? And also, here's the key. John, the apostle John, when he was on the island of Patmos, he had uh, some disciples that were following him under his teaching. One of them was Polycarp. Polycarp was the bishop, the, the pastor of the church of Smyrna, which is mentioned as one of the seven churches. He was there as the pastor of Smyrna, and he was under John's teaching. And he wrote, him and Papias, who also was under John's teaching, they both believed in premillennial. Amil came later, 500 years later, with Augustine. So I'm going to follow the early church fathers who were under John's teaching, and they taught the premillennial position. Okay, and this is an argument I have with some of my colleagues. They say, oh, it's all mill. Mm. I had one of them. I said, have you heard of Polycarp and, and uh, Papias? No, they're the early church fathers. They were under John's teaching. And they were pre, you no, know, really? And now they are reconsidering their position. <laughs> okay, I'm just letting you know, you gotta do your homework. You need to know these facts. Anyway, there's my uh, email if you want to get a hold of me. Amar, not Amadeus, it's Amar Deus.